Hello and welcome to the Leaders' Council podcast with me, Scott Chaloner. The podcast, just like the Leaders' Council itself, is all about recognising and celebrating those people who keep this country running. We exist to give leaders a voice outside of their own organisation and to support them in the same way they support their staff every single day of the week. If you are in a leadership position yourself and would like to have your voice heard on the national stage, I'd encourage you to go to leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply. Now, joining me on the programme today on what is a cool, cloudy autumn day here in the capital city is Michael Thorne. Michael is a tax specialist with over 25 years of experience in US and UK tax services for expatriates, primarily within the big four accountancy firms. Uh, Michael, very warm welcome to yourself today and thank you ever so much for taking the time to join us. Well, thank you, Scott. And, uh, yes, nice to be talking with you. It's a pleasure welcoming you onto the air with us, Michael. Um, Normally at this point in the programme, we tend to dive straight into the subject of leadership, but considering the ongoing COVID-19 situation, I do feel it's appropriate we approach the subject matter from that angle, because for leaders within all walks of life, it's proven to be such a significant challenge. For yourself, though, and your own business, Thorn Expatriate Tax Services, to what extent has the pandemic affected things? Well, I suppose first and foremost, I would say that um, the industry we in, we're in, we're extremely fortunate um, in the respect that um, the work hasn't stopped. Um, we we still have the, uh, the tax compliances services that we provide that uh, have to continue and, and still have to be met. Um, and, and and so our challenge wasn't so much in in staffing and whether we could keep people on and did we need to, you know, change hours. It was really the way that we, the way that we work and uh, making sure that we could still, still deliver those services. So, so extremely fortunate in the respect that um, the the effect on us was that was the way we work rather than the ability, the ability to deliver. That's very, very good uh, to uh, to hear, really encouraging that it's not affected that capacity to keep operating. And in terms of sort of adjusting procedures to sort of adapt to the changes that the pandemic has forced, what sort of changes have had to come into force, if any? Well, we're, we're, a, we're a small um, family business. There's, there's eight or nine of us. And we, you know, before um, lockdown, we were very much sort of office based. And um yeah, you know, we had to move very quickly to all being uh, working from home and uh, making sure that that was as as quick and as seamless as possible. Again, probably quite fortunate there because uh, my wife, who runs the business with me, her her background is in um, her former career was in airside management. So contingency planning was one of her one of her big bugbears as we were setting up uh, setting up the business. So again, we were pretty lucky in that we had some procedures. Um, in place, you know, not really ever expecting that we'd have to mm. use them, but uh, but we did. Absolutely right. And um, thinking about sort of how long this is likely to be in place for, because even if we do have a vaccine, it's unlikely to work as a magic bullet. Can you see some of these sort of ways of working um, that have come about during the lockdown period becoming almost a permanent fixture of the way that we do business in this country? Um, well, well, yes. I mean, it, it'll be interesting. I think that there are there are always changes. And I think, well, I should say first of all, I think a lot of people are very resilient, and so you you find a way to make things work. And I dare say that at the the end of this period, whenever that is, there will be some things that we hanker for and are looking forward to to returning to. And and at the same time, there will be um, innovations that have come in, different ways of working that we will want to keep. And I think that will that will develop over a period of time because I, I don't think we're going to have a sort of big bang uh, point where everybody returns from 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 day one back to working as they were before I think dif- you know different businesses will have different um, challenges with that and, and within our own bit business you know people's sensibilities and uh, c- concerns about returning to the office and, and how they work all have to be taken into account and I think one has to be empathetic with that mm. um, as well so um Yes, I mean we have flexible working um, already in terms of home and um, and, um, and from the office, but uh, but yeah, I think uh, it, we're able to work a lot more easier from home as a result of this because mm. uh, people have been set up, you know, to, to function more, you know, full time from home rather than it being a, a more occasional practice. 
And of course, just switching focus now to touch on leadership a little bit more broadly, which is, of course, why we are here. Um, you started your business, Thorn Expatriate Tax Services Limited, back in 2010. Do correct me if I'm wrong on that, Michael. Um, no, that's right. Yeah. I'm interested to um, understand what some of the um, influences and motivations were behind that decision to go into business for yourselves as a family. Yes, well, I had worked um, for um, well nigh 20 years within um, Big Four for uh, mm. providing UK and US um, expatriate tax services. Um, so 2010, I was a kind of a crossroads um, of career, whether I wanted to continue that and, uh, and what the options and alternatives were, um, particularly within the United Kingdom. And uh, I think uh, myself and my wife as well, we were very up for a, a new challenge and thought it was something that we could um, deliver to, to clients. Um, by forming our own business and, and really having a sort of per, a, a sorry um, a, a you know a very sort of personal a very personal service in terms of how we deliver the UK and US uh, compliance and advisory services because although you know the commodity is a is a tax return it's a filing with regulatory authorities I do consider it very much mm. a people business um, and the interaction with clients so it was something that excited us and I thought we would. Uh, We'd go for it at that time. Young family, children at school, you know, the ability to see more of them as well, mm. all of those factors came into play. I suppose it's quite easy from sort of a leadership point of view of working within your family as a business and um, just sort of thinking about um, how your sort of almost like sort of business model, leadership model has grown. Are there any sort of figures from your days working within those big four accountancy firms that you've encountered that have maybe influenced you and helped shape you into the person you are today, do you think? Oh yes, yes. I mean, I mean, for sure. Um, I think everybody that you come into contact with influences in in some ways, and sometimes positively, and sometimes negatively. But uh, yes, I mean, there are, there have been some you know very strong leaders d- during my career there that I've very much looked up to and admired um, in the way that they operated. Um, and you hope that some of those those things that you do admire and uh, um, that you continue in your own in your own development and how you then lead. And Michael, considering that this issue has been amplified by the ongoing COVID-19 situation at the moment, I was interested to ask you just to what extent do you think that mental health is important within leadership, both in terms of safeguarding your own well-being, but also that of the people you work with? Well, I think absolutely fundamental. Um, Anyway, and I think the you know the events of the last few months have brought that into sort of very sharp focus. Um, when you're together and you're in the office and you see mo- uh, each other most of the time, then um, you can very much sort of check up on each other, make sure that everybody's well. We're, we're quite a close knit um, group um, within the firm. Now, moving to uh, you know to lockdown, and particularly during the lockdown period when when you know, people could potentially sort of feel very isolated then um, mm. you know, things like zoom team meetings um, regular catch-ups they were all I think very important just for us all to check up um, on each other that we were coping well both with work and, and outside of work so um, you know the last thing you want is people feeling unnecessarily stressed by their work when there are all sorts of other things to cope with and everybody's got their own situation and their own mm. touch points with that so um, yeah, very important. It certainly highlights and, um, the importance. Yes, yeah, carry on, Michael. So I was going to say, and I think um, that will continue um, mm. through the, the winter. In fact, I see the coming few months as, as as even more of a challenge with that. You know, in some respects, the first three or four months when there's a lockdown and it's very tight rules, then um, it's a little bit easier to, to monitor how people are feeling, and and um, there's a very sort of quite a tight boundary in terms of what you can and can't do. Um, and we had a very, um, you know, hot, warm um, summer. So outside environment was sort of quite important, I think, in, in assisting people's mental health. As we go mm. into the winter with, you know, colder, darker, a bit more uncertainty perhaps about what's happening and what we can and can't do and, and how that may change, I think that aspect is going to be very important to keep on top of with everybody. 
Mm. And what certainly technology has done, uh, as I was about to say, is um, it's really helped keep the communication channels open during this time. And it has highlighted the importance of communication between leaders and between their teams and um, how important that is in sort of keeping well-being and morale high. Um, And just thinking about the winter now, as you sort of alluded to there, which is coming it will be with us um, over the course of the year uh, the next uh, few months um what is it over the uh, the next sort of 12 months michael that you're really hoping to achieve as a business in this uncertain landscape and what are you really hoping to have achieved well it's interesting I mean, as i think i mentioned at the beginning that we're very fortunate in that our work hasn't stopped um and we still have a, a you know very sort of thriving business to to manage and work in Um, And I think a lot of the challenges over the next 12 months will be both continuing that and also dealing with our client situations. But by the nature of what we do, we're dealing with people who are living uh, perhaps not in their home country for work or for personal reasons. And we're now coming across those situations where um, you know, our, our clients have been um, moved around or have moved around either voluntarily or been locked down and quarantined in different places. And so I think there's going to be a lot of sorting out of uh, people's tax affairs over the next 12 months who have had cross-border um, considerations. And mm. really, I sort of hope that we come out of that as a business still thriving and also having provided you know, solutions and some guidance and assistance to our, to our clients. So uh, hopefully we will come out of all of this and we can then um, stride on to the future. Yeah, it certainly seems as if there's plenty to be getting on with over the uh, the next few months and plenty of opportunities out there. And I certainly wish you all the luck in the world in capitalising on that, Michael. And I think actually, just given how um, there are still a great many variables in this and there's still a lot to be determined in how we move through the pandemic, that it would be really intellectually valuable to actually catch up and have you back on the programme in a few months' time so that we can just assess what has changed in the time between we've spoken and uh, also just see how things are getting on behind the scenes at the business and how you're really starting to seize those opportunities yes yes we're very happy to do so yeah yes i'd certainly welcome that opportunity as well michael it's been a real real pleasure welcoming you on to today's program and most importantly as well until we do hopefully get to speak again please do take care and stay safe with all that is still going on as well thank you scott thanks I'd also like to extend that message to all of the listeners tuning into today's programme. Please do continue to look after yourselves, stay well and be considerate of others because it does make such a key difference in saving lives during this time. Um, It was a pleasure for me to welcome Michael Thorne onto today's programme. And coming up next on the show today, we'll be handing over to Jonathan White for his exclusive interview with former England cricket captain Sir Andrew Strauss. Now, during his playing days, Sir Andrew joined an illustrious club of just three England captains to secure the Ashes, both at home and away in Australia, and racked up the second highest number of test victories for an England skipper in history. Since retiring from playing, Sir Andrew spent a brief period of time as Director of Cricket for the England and Wales Cricket Board, and has become a champion for charitable and mental health concerns. And I do hope that you all enjoy listening just as much as Jonathan welcomed the opportunity to speak with him. That is, of course, coming up next. Hello and welcome. I'm Jonathan White and today we are joined by Sir Andrew Strauss, former captain of the England cricket team and former director of cricket at the ECB. Sir Andrew, thank you very much for joining us today. Real pleasure to be here. Thank you. The pleasure is all of ours. You know, Andrew, you've had a distinguished career, as I said, both on and off the pitch in English cricket, recognised not least with your knighthood for services to sport just last year. So congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, there have been ups and downs in the career, like any career, including public and private disagreements with certain individuals. And on that front, I think what everybody wants to know, have you finally forgiven Marcus Dresscothic for giving you that stupid Lord Brockett nickname? <laughs> um, well, m- my recollection was that it wasn't Marcus Dresscothic who gave me that nickname. Ah. It was actually Mark Butcher. Uh, He's but to blame. You know, I think there were a lot of people. It was the senior England teams at the mo- mm. at that time who wanted to sort of put me in my place and make sure that I didn't get above my station. So um, uh, thankfully, it didn't particularly <laughs> stick, other than within those group of players. And you really did try and get on their nerves by getting above your station, because of course, in your first outing, uh, you went on to score 112. Mm. Now, am I right in saying this, perhaps, that you only got there because Michael Vaughan did himself an injury? Well, that was the reason I got on the pitch in the yes. first place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
you know, it's often sort of misunderstood or misjudged the role that luck plays in a in an international career or sporting career. Full stop. And um, you know, I was wait, waiting patiently in the wings mm. for an opportunity, and it didn't really seem like an opportunity was going to come along. And then you know, Warnie uh, got injured in the nets, and there was my chance, and I had to kind of grab it with both hands if I could. And you certainly did. What was it like then to? see your name being put up on the Lord's Honour Board after your first appearance? Yeah, look, I'd just been transported to a completely different world almost. I'd been, I was a Middlesex player, I was mm. captain of Middlesex, all my focus was on helping Middlesex sort of win the championship and whatever. And then a week later, I have scored a test century, which is something I'd always dreamed out, you know, literally all my life. Of and then the thought of doing it at Lords in your first test match. I mean, it was literally the dream. So, and then suddenly I started thinking, wow, hold on, not, potentially I've got a whole England career ahead of me and everything that entails. So it was a real shock to the system. Um, but I suppose what I was grateful for was that I was rel- relatively old, probably not the right way of putting it, but I was 27 of years course. of age. I was pretty comfortable with my own game. And I was also, I think mature enough to understand um, that this was a great opportunity for me, but not to get carried away with it, which is unfortunately what happens with a lot of younger players. Without a doubt. And I think in those early years of your career, it's so important. I think you'd agree, especially when you're learning from other more experienced people. This can be true of any field, whether it's sports or politics or business. um, To have somebody there that you can rely on or look up to for guidance. In those early days, was there somebody that you could say to this day that, thank goodness they were there for you? Uh, Well, I think in preparing me for international cricket, Justin Langer was a massive um, Mm. source of advice for me. So he was captain of Millsets a couple of years beforehand and really helped me understand what I needed to do to get there. Um, But then I think on the day-to-day basis, my wife Ruth played a a huge Mm. role. You know, just in terms of because I, I think there is that real danger that you get carried away with it, and you think yes. international sport in that goldfish bowl that you know you're more important than you you were previously, or that that whole world is the real world, and uh, and obviously all we know is that the real world nothing's changed other than mm-hmm. other people's perception of you, and you need that grounding. And again, that can be true of any uh, so many different areas of life. I think so. Yeah, I, I mean. Very easy to get caught up in it and end up doing different things, being with different people, sort of trying to enjoy everything that goes with international cricket rather than focusing on the actual international cricket. And in those early days, Andrew, there were lots of examples where you could have got carried away because that team accomplished so much. Um, I think for a lot of people, the 2005 Ashes series is one of the greatest sporting moments of this country's history now we could chat for hours about that but i know uh i wouldn't be allowed to and and, and you've got <laughs> other places to be so <laughs> we can't do that but i if i may i would love to ask what your highlight was personally for that but perhaps more importantly um as a team how were you able as a group to deal with the pressure no doubt you were feeling yeah well the the pressure is like nothing else that i experienced before or after because you know i think it's easy to forget how how much of a holy grail the Ashes was mm. back then. You know, we hadn't won it for so long and it seemed like we'd come up against these invincible Australian teams year after year. So, you know, the, the closer we got to it, the harder it became. Um, I remember Ashley Giles walking into the dressing room for the, I think it was in the final day of the series and I looked at him and he looked absolutely terrible, <laughs> like just white of a sheet, grey, he looked like aged about five years. I went, God, Charlie, you're not looking too good. And he went, yeah, it's not surprising. I haven't slept for eight weeks. <laughs> and I went, well, join the club. Quite. You know, and I think we'd all been sort of living this behind our own closed doors. And um, yeah, it, it's just an extraordinary thing. And uh, without doubt, the the highlight was, number one, drawing that game at the Oval yes. to make sure we, we, we won the Ashes. But also the day after, you know, that open top bus parade around London and to understand that we'd broken out of the cricket bubble, that they're just general sports fans or just people that were interested in 
in seeing England win at something, we're all engaged and uh, completely besotted by the whole thing. I think that's such a key point, you know, because there's, there's so, there were so many people back in 2005 that may have not even given cricket a second glance, and it put a whole new generation, especially of children, school kids, into loving that sport. And so beyond the actual competition itself, what a fantastic thing to be able to say was accomplished for, for cricket. Absolutely. Uh, everything you say there is absolutely right. Like we, we just sort of opened the doors of cricket to a whole new generation. But probably more importantly, it was the one and only time in my life that I got papped outside a nightclub that <laughs> night when we were celebrating. You know, I felt like I'd really arrived in well a celebrity. Yes. <laughs> it only happened for that one night, unfortunately. But I, I did ask for a highlight, and if you didn't perhaps give a specific one on the pitch, uh, uh, so I would suggest perhaps that catch at Trent Bridge. No, no, <laughs> no. I mean, the, the catch at Trent Bridge was, uh, you know, you see a ball, you stick out your hand, and it goes in. I, I think um, my personal highlight was I scored a hundred in that fifth Test yes. match under real pressure, and that that was one that, you know, that that wasn't a moment. That was a, a number of hours, and I had to dig pretty deep to do that. Now. Obviously, not that long later, uh, as you were lucky enough and privileged, I'm sure, no doubt, to serve as captain. And whether you like it or not, you become the focal point of criticism. Uh, you were looked on, up to and relied upon to be strong, especially when the going gets tough. You become a leader in many senses of the word. Uh, during your time as captain, what qualities does one require to fulfil that role? Ha. <laughs> um... Well, a fair amount of resilience for starters. You know, you're absolutely right. You, you know, I, I remember when I, I got the role, it, it did feel like the biggest sort of poison chalice of all time, and that you know, <laughs> yes. sort of a litany of England captains had sort of been churned up by the job prior to me taking over. So th there was that sort of realization: this is going to be a tough thing to do, um, and you're going to have to dig pretty deep. But I think actually, the most important thing was sort of just pushing all that noise to one side and just clarifying, okay, if I'm going to do this job, what is it that we really want to achieve out of this? Mm. And so you, th th suddenly that becomes a bit more exciting and a bit more enticing, the idea of, well, we can do something that's never been done before here and I've got the opportunity to to play my part in that. So, um, you know, I think that, that was a big part of it for me. Um, you know, I think a lot of those qualities around leadership – I don't think you know you have them until you're in that situation. Absolutely. It's very hard to prepare yourself properly for those sort of situations. Um, and when managing a team, uh, you're required to manage, of course, what some people could call big personalities. Others could use different shorter words. <laughs> How poisonous can it be, players, when players, and indeed, and this applies again to so many different areas of life, when individuals um, think they are perhaps more important than, than a team? Well, I, I think probably worth broadening out that a bit. You know, I, I think there there are all sorts of different people that you have to um, sort of contend with in a team environment, and uh, the job of a, the leadership or the management is to tr to try and sort of gel them all together and get them bought into what you're trying to do and whatever. So, you know, th there are some people that are a bit more self absorbed. There's some people that are slightly more maverick in the, the way they, they view the world. Um, there's some people that are very quiet. Uh, there's some people that are, you know, p perhaps very worried about what might go wrong. Uh, and so you've got to try and mm. understand all these people individually and try and get the best out of them. Um, but, th th yeah, there was definitely a line there for me in terms of um, embracing difference up to the point where someone doing following their agenda – was going in a completely different path from the team's agenda. And, you know, if and when that happens, that, that should be a problem for a leadership. And if it isn't a problem, then you're not doing your but job. Absolutely. Um, and with, with all that in mind, actually, uh, and perhaps this is a bit of a wing question, but what advice would you give to others in a similar position, leading a team, um, being looked up to? What would be the key advice you'd give to them? And that you couldn't really do without it. Just generally about leading I, I a team. I think so. Yes. Okay. Uh, number one thing about leadership, I'm absolutely certain about this, is that the people you're leading need to know that you care about them. Mm. And if if they genuinely believe you've got their best interests at heart, 
they will forgive all sorts of other inadequacies you might have. And I've definitely had many. Um, because they, they'll know your heart's in the right place and they, uh, they'll they feel comforted. There'll be a degree of sort of psychological safety or some, or whatever it might you might term to to make sure that the, the team comes together when the going gets tough. If they genuinely don't believe you care about them and you're in it for yourself, um, it doesn't matter how charismatic you might be. It doesn't matter, you know, how gregarious and, and how um, impressive you might be as a person. They will be wary of you mm. and they will start looking after their own interests very quickly. Um, now, in 20. 20- 15, obviously, you were appointed as director of the ECB. Uh, you took some pretty uh, major steps early on. Um, you brought in Trevor Bayliss as coach, was or was brought in. Um, you put a much greater emphasis on limited overs cricket. Now, in the abstract, what had you identified that needed to be changed um, for English cricket? And were there qualities that you had developed, you'd found out you had as England captain, that you were able to bring over the job? Um, okay, so the first thing was we had this unbelievable opportunity of the World Cup on Hoyam Sol in yes. 2019. Uh, I was, firstly, I was sick and tired of watching us make the same mistakes in World Cups, and this includes my time as captain. We just kept it on the sleepwalking our way into it and pretending everything would be on the, all right mm. on the night, and it never was. Um, and so... I definitely made it our priority to win that 2019 World Cup. I thought that was more important than anything else that was going to be taking place in my tenure. Um, and I knew in order to do that, we had to completely shift our perception of white ball cricket. Quite a radical shift from what we, we, what we were coming from. Yeah, but mm. the rest of the game had moved on. Yeah. And the rest of the game had understood that white ball cricket was playing an increasingly important role in, in both financially, but also in, in terms of, players focus and interest yes. um and we had to move with, in fact we didn't have to move as times we need to get ahead of the time <laughs> so you know we had to completely shift out both our philosophy but also the way we played in order to do that um and i was very lucky uh having both trevor bayless and owen morgan who were prepared to sort of role model that and lead that through um and the second part of your question around what have the England captaincy sort of done to prepare me for the role? I, I think I was comfortable leading. I was, I knew mm. the environment. I knew what I was getting myself into. And, and in the early days, I could leverage some of the relationships that I had with the players. But actually, I found it a very different challenge because you are so so far removed from what's going on on the ground. Right. And so, you know, you're relying on other people to have to buy into what you want to happen and then do it themselves mm. and often you know in different time zones in different parts of the world so that was that was a very new experience for me well i think the strategy paid off and uh, i don't know about you but when watching that world cup final again as so many people did in this country it's once again it inspired another generation of uh, especially school kids who again might not have given cricket a second look who have now become Avid cricket fans. I know of some, it, and it, what what a wonderful thing that must be. Yeah, it was an incredible day, wasn't it? I mean, I think in our vision, like when we're talking about the opportunity of winning the 2019 World Cup, I had this vision in my mind of Lords on a sunny day and a close finish and the incredible kind of you know emotion that went with it. Mm. No one could have dreamt no. how it played out. I've never seen anything. I've never seen a game of cricket like that in my whole life, and for it to be. The World Cup final was quite extraordinary. I know some fantastically avid cricket fans who were Googling there and then what exactly the rules became. Because I yeah, well, so <laughs> was, was I, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, in your, in your wife's memory, you established the Ruth Strauss Foundation last year. Uh, in doing so, whether you'd admit it or not, yourself and the foundation has become an inspiration to thousands, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters. Please do take some time, if you wouldn't mind, and you to explain to the listeners the work the foundation does and and what it's been like to lead a project like that. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, look, I mean, we obviously had a very tough journey as a family. First of all, Ruth being diagnosed, Ruth was someone that was always well. You never think she was going to be someone that was sort of laid down by cancer. And for us to find out that she had lung cancer was mm. extraordinary. She'd never smoked a, a cigarette in her life. And I think we all had this perception of lung cancer being a smoker's disease. Um, 
And so just uh, having gone through the experience and obviously some very low times and us coming to terms with the fact that, that Ruth had stage four cancer and she was going to die, um, we learned a lot in that process. And, and thankfully, we had time for me to speak to Ruth before she died about legacy and what we could do to make something positive come out of you know this experience we'd all been through. And so after she died in December uh, 2018... Uh, I came back and launched a foundation with two f- focuses. Number one, to fund research into these rare forms of lung cancer. These mm. are the non-smoking lung cancers. Um, five to 7,000 people each year in this country are diagnosed with these. No one knows why they're getting them, um, but they're on the increase, and it's women, young women that are affected more than men. Extraordinary so, numbers. Yeah, I mean, it, in the list of top 10 cancers... It's number eight. Rare forms right. of lung cancer, number eight. So it's not really rare. It's probably a misnomer. But it's, um, yeah, we're really lacking in funding and understanding. And then the second element, and probably this is in some ways more pressing, is um, to help uh, cancer, anyone who's got cancer who has an incurable uh, diagnosis, to help them and their families prepare themselves for death. Mm. And so in order to do that, we need to be able to find ways of them having open conversations with each other because if you do this well, it should help the bereavement afterwards if you're well prepared for it. It's not something people like to do. I was very lucky that Ruth wanted to do it. Um, but also we have to have that debate about about the taboo of death and yes. you know, effectively how uncomfortable we are talking about it and certainly how bad we are preparing for it. If you, if you think for a moment about antenatal casters before you have your mm. baby like how we're preparing you for the how your life's going to change and we do nothing around death even though we're all going to experience it in one shape way shape or form and um you know we i think as a society we need to be better than that we, we've come a long way in so many different areas and especially around mental health and we can do better about death there's no doubt about it well i think it's it, the foundation is leading the way in breaking taboos on that front because they need to be broken um uh, I know they've got the foundation is going at some events later this year. So if you could tell us about some of those, that would be yeah. So the uh, I mean, we've got a couple of big ones coming up. So uh, the Westminster Mile, which is a, a very inclusive. If you're thinking about think about a marathon, but just think about just doing a mile of a marathon <laughs> rather than 26. Sounds ideal. So we've got grandparents, we've got little kids, we've got people pushing prams, so that we're going to get as many people as possible to play their part in that and raise some funds. Um, we've got the Red for Ruth Day at Lords again, so that was an incredible day for us yeah. last year. You could, you, whether you were there or not, especially if you were there, I mean to say, but whether it was the photos in the papers the next day, what an extraordinary! I think it was the fifteenth of April, wasn't it? What an extraordinary day, and what an overwhelming day that must have been for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, an Ashes Test match is a big day anyway, yes. and then f- for us to have that extra element of the the Red for Ruth Day and to see the the wave of support you know it's probably it was just i myself and the boys were incredibly profoundly affected by that uh, in a good way you know felt so much uh, love and support there and then the foundation is directly benefited hugely by the the funds raised and um we want to take it up a gear this year and, and make it more of a community thing not just the the day at lords um i even saw some of the stuffiest members of the mcc and you're wearing red uh, wearing red so what w- what an extraordinary thing yeah well a lot um, of them <laughs> wear red trousers <laughs> they, anyway no, i think but um <laughs> no it, absolutely you know they, they were right behind us and um you know we, we really want that to be something that's embedded in in the english summer uh, just like the mcgrath foundation days yes. in, in sydney in australia well it's been a complete inspiration um and uh, i very much hope we can talk about that perhaps late in a few months as well absolutely. um before we go, as I'm conscious of the time, we uh, it's also an exciting year for domestic cricket, um, not least uh, because of the introduction of the 100, not without its critics, though, I should. And I know you're uh, a big proponent of it. Um, the Blast has clearly shown um, that the short form of the game has brought cricket to a new and growing audience, exciting games. Uh, what do you say to those that ask, why do we need the 100 as well? Uh, well... So the 100 is the most important uh, step forward in domestic cricket in this country ever. And the reason for that is that increasingly, well, there's two things. First of all, we need to break out of the cricket bubble. So 
the blast followers tend to be the same people that follow other cricket. Right. And therefore, you know, that's a small audience, mm-hmm. and potentially a, a declining one over time, even though the bra- blast sales are increasing. Uh, we need to break out of that and try and get g- more general sports fans into cricket. Um, but more importantly, um, just the, the way the tournament's set up and it's one day, one game a day over a six-week period, broadcasters will pay money for that. And therefore, what we're trying to do is re- reduce our reliance on international cricket paying all the bills. If you think about test cricket and some of the issues around the world, we just can't rely on that money coming in mm. to fund the game. So we need to find another way of doing that. Um, I, I just think it's going to be an incredible success. I'm so excited about it. I know there are people that are worried about it, but in two or three years' time, um, you know, we're going to have our own uh, short-form tournament that will rival the Big Bash and will be moving towards the IPL. And those are you know, those are two enormous events out there, and we can have our own version of that ourselves. I can feel your enthusiasm for it. As, a, as an Essex fan, I, I'm still stumped as to... I think I'm going to have to choose between either supporting a team based at the Oval or a team based at Lords. I, <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll get over that, but I'll, I'll yeah, have to do well it. Well, surely it's got to be the Lords one, right? That sh- sh- of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sanju, it's been an absolute pleasure discussing that and everything else with you today. Thank you very much. Cheers. This has been the Leaders' Council podcast. Thank you for celebrating excellence in leadership with us. I've been your host, Scott Challoner. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you for listening to our podcast. The views expressed within the podcast do not reflect the views of the Leaders' Council of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, its parent company or subsidiaries, members of staff, or other guests of any other person therein associated.